Good morning. <laughs> On behalf of the Friends of the National World War II Memorial, I offer our sincere thanks and appreciation to Lieutenant General Plain and Ms. Ambassador and the National Defense University for hosting today's 11th annual Hayden Williams World War II Memorial Lecture. As chair of the Friends of the National World War II Memorial, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce you to our lecturer today. James Scott is one of our finest military historians, a, foreman, a former Neiman Fellow at Harvard. Mr. Scott has written several highly acclaimed books. His most recent book, published this spring, is Black Snow, Curtis LeMay, The Firebombing of Tokyo, and The Road to the Atomic Bomb. Mr. Scott is also the author of Rampage, chosen as a finalist for the prestigious Gilder Lehman Prize for Military History by the New York Historical Society. His other works include Target Tokyo, which is a 2016 Pulitzer Prize finalist, The War Below, and The Tack on the Liberty, which won the Rear Admiral Samuel Elliott Morrison Award. We are delighted that Mr. Scott is with us this morning to share his insights into superlative leadership and the important lessons that can still be learned from World War II. Mr. Scott. Good morning. I hope everybody's doing well today. It's a real uh, privilege and an honor to get to join you all today and to deliver today's Hayden Williams World War II Memorial Lecture. To follow in the footsteps of esteemed colleagues and historians who've given this lecture in the past, Historians like my good friend Alex Kershaw, Ian Toll, and Craig Simons. I also want to thank the Friends of the National World War II Museum for inviting me here. It's an amazing organization dedicated to teaching the lessons of World War II to future generations. And I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Director Holly Rotundi, Board Chair Jane Dropa, and all the other members of the Distinguished Board who helped, who helped promote this worthy cause. I'd also like to thank NDU President Lieutenant General Michael Plain and his terrific leadership staff for inviting me here today and for being so hospitable. Now before I begin, I was thinking about World War II and about leadership and I was reminded of a, uh, I was just at a conference this past week with Alex and talking about World War II. And for folks who are studying history and, and historiography of World War II, I'm sure you're familiar with the book that came out a number of years ago, uh, How the War Was Won by Philip O'Brien. And it argues effectively that the, that World War II was always going to be won by the Allies because they had the largest economic and industrial might and that victory was really a foregone conclusion. And uh, I was thinking about that when I was watching Alex give a terrific presentation on the, the first wave at D-Day and what it took for those young men from small towns and big cities across America to come out of those Higgins boats and to charge directly into the line of fire uh, in order to take those beaches in France. Uh, and I was reminded of that as well when I was thinking about this lecture today on Jimmy Doolittle, because it's a story as well uh, of a virtual suicide mission of 80 volunteer airmen who did the unthinkable in our nation's darkest hour. And so I think that when you, when you boil down the argument of World War II to one of economics and industry, what is often lost in that is the impact of leadership the impact of determination and the impact of courage of what it takes to be the ones who run into that line of fire. Now for the Doolittle Raid, which I'm gonna talk about this morning, it really was America's answer to the attack on Pearl Harbor. A surprise attack on Tokyo executed just four months after the Japanese struck Hawaii. It was a virtual suicide mission. 16 bombers crewed by 80 young men who flew a one-way mission to pummel Japan's factories warehouses and shipyards, and then escape to free China. But it was much more than just a bombing raid. The raid was a powerful tonic needed to rally a shell-shocked nation, to assure the U.S. public in its darkest hour that in the end, America would prevail. America would win. The effect that raid had on this country eight decades ago was profound. 
Americans were so moved by the heroism of these airmen that a war bond poster signed by Mission Commander Jimmy Doolittle fetched a staggering $4 million in 1942. That's the equivalent of $58 million today for a signed poster. A town in Missouri went so far as to change its name to Doolittle in his honor. In fact, you can still go to Doolittle, Missouri today if you're driving cross country. And of course, the raid had even greater effects on the direction of the war. It prompted the Japanese in the summer of 1942 to make an ill-fated grab for Midway Island, a disastrous naval battle in which they lost four aircraft carriers in a single day. Uh, and shifted the balance of power in the Pacific back in favor of the United States. But it was the Chinese who paid the largest price. Outraged by the raid, Japan launched a retaliatory campaign against the Chinese that killed an estimated 250,000 men, women, and children in prompted comparisons to the rape of Nanking. All of these things occurred because of 16 bombers crewed by 80 volunteer airmen. That is what I think makes the Doolittle Raid one of the most incredible stories of World War II. Now, the Doolittle Raid really began on the morning America entered World War II. In the pre-dawn hours, that Sunday, December 7, 1941, six Japanese aircraft carriers, the largest carrier task force that had ever put to sea, cut through the dark swells 230 miles north of Oahu. Throughout those carriers, airmen rose early and dressed in clean loincloths and pressed uniforms, pausing alongside Shinto shrines to uh, sip sake before heading topside to their planes. The faint light of dawn punctured the morning clouds as the carriers increased speed and swung into the wind to prepare to launch. 183 fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes roared off the carrier's flight decks in the first wave of the attack, followed by a second strike of 167 planes. The attack on Pearl Harbor was more than just a raid, but the dramatic opening act of war against the United States. A surgical strike designed to mortally wound America's powerful Pacific fleet anchored in the cool Hawaiian waters. Japanese Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, the architect of the attack, knew it was imperative for Japan to sideline the United States before the war even began. The fate of our empire, he warned, depends upon this operation. That Sunday morning, American forces slumbered. Troops had been out the night before cruising down Honolulu's famous Hotel Street lined with tattoo parlors, pinball joints, and shooting galleries. Others had watched Clark Gable as the frontier con man in the movie Honky Tonk, or attended the finals and the battles of the bands at Pearl Harbor's new block recreation center. When Japanese planes appeared in the skies over Pearl Harbor that Sunday morning, America was caught completely off guard. This is actually a captured Japanese photograph that shows the beginning of the raid um, and you can actually see the spray coming up there and a plane in the sky from one of the first strikes on the battleships moored there at Ford Island. Pearl Harbor resembled a parking lot that morning, with 94 ships in port, almost half of the entire Pacific fleet. Pilots immediately zeroed in on the nine battleships moored side by side. This is another Japanese photograph that shows the oil spilling out of the battleships Oklahoma in the top right and the West Virginia. Japanese strategists had perfected the plan of the attack down to the use of wooden torpedo fins needed to run in Pearl Harbor's shallow waters. Here, a boat attempts to rescue sailors from the battleship West Virginia, which was hit by as many as nine torpedoes that morning. And of course, the smoke from the burning warships darkened the horizon for miles. In addition to targeting the Navy's warships, Japanese forces zeroed in on Hawaii's airfields, including Naval Air Station at Pearl Harbor ultimately destroying almost 200 planes that morning. The attack on Pearl Harbor destroyed or damaged 18 ships, including eight battleships. Pictured here is the capsized battleship Oklahoma. And the human toll, of course, proved horrific. Casualties among soldiers, sailors, and Marines, and civilians soared to more than 3,500, a figure that included 2,403 people who were killed. President Roosevelt was in the White House finishing up lunch when news of the attack reached Washington. That afternoon, as damage reports continued to pour in, he wrote what was arguably his most famous speech, even though it totaled barely 500 words. His use of the word infamy, his son later noted, would forever describe what happened that day. And if you go and you look at the draft of that speech, he originally wrote that it was a date that would live in world history before he scratched that out, choosing infamy instead. The next day at 12.30 p.m., he delivered that speech to, uh, before Congress asking for a declaration of war. 
Now, personally, Roosevelt was sickened by the attack, and he knew that the immediate patriotism that flared up in the days that immediately followed would prove short-lived. He also knew that America was no, in no position to go on a sustained offensive. It would take much of 1942, in fact, to enlist and train new troops, to build more ships, planes, rifles, and bullets. Yet he knew that the American public's patience would not last that long. So before rescuers could even pull all of the dead out of the oily waters of Pearl Harbor, he summoned his senior military leaders and demanded America find a way to strike back. Not a raid against some far-flung island in the Japanese empire, but an attack on Tokyo. The challenge facing American war planners was just how to do it. America had no bases in the region from which to operate. In addition to the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had seized Guam and Wake, and the Philippines under siege would fall in a few months. Japanese had likewise taken Hong Kong and Singapore from the British and the oil-rich Dutch East Indies from the Netherlands. In a few short months, Japan had established an empire that stretched across more than 20 million square miles in seven time zones. Not only did the United States not have any bases in the region from which to operate, but it was deemed too risky for us to send our handful of aircraft carriers that were not at Pearl Harbor that, uh, that, that Sunday morning, to send them all the way across the Pacific into the enemy's backyard. They were just too precious of a commodity to risk losing them at that point in the war. None of that, however, mattered to FDR. In all of his meetings with his senior military leaders, he continued to press America to find a way to strike back at Japan. Now, while at Norfolk, one of Admiral King, who was the CNO at the time, Admiral Ernest King, one of his staffers was down there checking up on the Hornet, which was getting ready to come online. And uh, while he was down there, he happened to see a airstrip, an airfield marked up to resemble a carrier's flight deck. And naval aviators were practicing takeoffs from that. And just seeing that juxtaposition prompted an idea. What if instead of using short range single engine Navy fighters, what if America swapped those out and used long range army bombers to take off from the deck of an aircraft carrier? And that spark, that idea, became the genesis of what today we now know as the Doolittle Raid. Now turning that concept into a reality fell to 45-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, who was without a doubt one of the most fascinating characters of the 20th century. Born in California, he was ultimately grew up largely in Alaska, where his father was an unsuccessful gold prospector. Now, Alaska in his youth was not like what you see today from the bow of your cruise ships. It was a, uh, far more like the Wild West, a frontier land. There were uh, very few paved roads, uh, saloons far outnumbered grocery stores. Doolittle actually watched his best friend in childhood get torn apart by dogs in the street one time. Now, Doolittle was small in stature. He stood just five feet, four inches tall. But on all his military records, he upped his height by two inches. And being a small kid in the wild west of Alaska, he realized he needed to learn how to fight if he was going to survive. And so he started to box. And he became so good at it, in fact, that he later became a professional boxer. Now, <clears throat> Doolittle eventually returned to California and enrolled in college. And he'd always harbored an interest in flying. So he enlisted in the Army when World War I began. And on his first fight, a flight, he fell in love with it. He proved so good at it, in fact, that rather than send him to Europe, the Army kept him home to train others. Quote, my students were going overseas and becoming heroes, he later lamented. My job was to stay home and make more heroes. Now, when the war ended, Doolittle chose to remain in the service, recognizing that it was the one place where he could fly every day and still earn a steady paycheck. Now, it's important to remember, this is the early era of aviation. Okay? This is the time of barnstorming. Okay? Pilots are out setting records, they're doing aerial feats, there's competitions, there's races, and all that. Now, Doolittle, the fighter, the boxer, the scrapper, decides he's going to jump into that. And so he, uh, he goes on, he sets a number of speed records. Uh, he's also the first pilot to ever fly cross-country in less than a day. And it took him 22 hours to do so. And of course, there's no GPS at this point, so he's literally flying using Rand McNally road maps as he crosses the country from one side to the next. But Doolittle was also brilliant. He earned his master's and his doctorate from MIT. And he realized that one of the biggest challenges facing early aviation was the inability to fly if you couldn't see where you were going. So he helped develop the artificial horizon, which is still standard on planes today. And he's the first person to ever take off, fly over a set course, and land again using only instrumentation. 
And he accomplished this inside of a, uh, in order to pull off this feat for the Guggenheim, they actually put him in a cockpit and zippered him inside with a piece of canvas over it. So he was literally inside a cocoon. Now, to make sure that the plane didn't crash, they had another pilot at a set of controls in front of him who had to fly with his hands above his head throughout the entire flight just so that observers on the ground would know that Doolittle was actually the one controlling the airplane. Now, the New York Times summed him up best in 1927 when they said, quote, Doolittle is as gifted with brains as he is with courage. So when World War II began, Doolittle was the staff troubleshooter for Army Air Force's General Hap Arnold. And one of his first assignments in that role was to take this idea of a raid on Tokyo and turn it into reality. And as you can see, he was really the perfect person to help bring together a feat that would require courage, leadership, and ingenuity. Doolittle first looked at logistics, and he determined that the B-25 was the best plane for this operation. And he picked it largely because it had a seven-foot wing clearance. It meant that it could just barely slide by and take off, have just enough clearance to miss a, a suit, the superstructure or the island of an aircraft carrier and be able to take off. But he also recognized that there was no way, if you could take off, that you'd be able to land again on, a, on an aircraft carrier. So this would have to be a one-way mission. So he realized that his planes needed to be able to fly about 2,400 miles. Okay, so the B-25's range was about 1,200 miles, so he was going to have to effectively double that. And aviation fuel is really heavy. A gallon of aviation fuel weighs over six pounds. So if you're going to literally double how much fuel capacity, you're going to have to strip everything you can off of that plane. That included radios, which they didn't want to have anybody accidentally alert the Japanese they were coming. That included guns in a lot of cases uh, and all sorts of other hardware in order to do it. Now, in order, because they knew they were going to fly low and without without a, a belly gun underneath, they did come up with a little ruse, which was if they took two black boards that essentially resembled broomsticks and painted them black and stuck them out the back of the B-25, it would at least look like they had guns back there, even though they really didn't. Doolittle also had to pick his airmen. Now, the B-25, we'd go on to build about 10,000 of them over the course of World War II, but it was a really new airplane in, uh, in 1942. And a handful of squadrons were flying them out in the Pacific Northwest doing anti-submarine patrols. So Doolittle ordered those men transferred from there down to Columbia, South Carolina. And there he picked what would ultimately be his 79 volunteer airmen for this mission. He then transferred those crews down to the Florida Panhandle to train under a Navy pilot to learn the art of carrier takeoffs. Meanwhile, the Navy began assembling its task force of 16 warships, crewed by more than 10,000 sailors under the command of the colorful Admiral Bull Halsey. Now, the risks that the Navy was willing to take for this operation were extraordinary. Now, if you're going to take these B-25s onto an aircraft carrier, the Hornet in this case, they're so big that they're not going to be able to go up and down in the aircraft um, uh, in the hangar elevator. So they'd all have to be tied down on deck, which meant that if the Hornet came under attack, they'd have no way to swap out for fighters. So they had to send a second carrier along with them, the Enterprise, for cover. At this point, America had, at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, we had three aircraft carriers in the Pacific. The Hornet would come online, which would give us four, and we would move one over from the Atlantic. So we had five aircraft carriers, okay? Japan had 10. So we were literally half their power in the Pacific for naval aviation there. And we were gonna send two of those carriers all the way across the Pacific, 5,200 miles to the enemy's backyard, and hope that nowhere along the way would they run into any stray merchant ships, submarines, or patrol planes that might spoil the much-needed secrecy this operation uh, depended upon. April 2nd, 1942, just 16 weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Hornet departed San Francisco bound for Tokyo. The carrier's only protection was a task force of ships, which included four cruisers and eight destroyers. Tied down on deck, the Hornet, with wheels chalk, stood 16 B-25 Army bombers. Here's a close-up shot of one of those. The bombers had so little room that the tail of the 16th plane literally dangled over the carrier's fantail. Now, the task force steamed across the northern Pacific, taking a route that guaranteed cold, rough, difficult weather, but also decreased the likelihood that they would run into any other sea traffic at that time. But as you can imagine, such weather made refueling difficult, including a picture you see here of that. Several sailors were washed overboard and had to be recovered at sea. Now, as the task force neared Japan on April 17, 1942, Doolittle and his men held a brief ceremony on board the Hornet, 
wiring Japanese medals that had been given to American sailors during a 1908 visit to Yokohama to the bombs that would soon fall on Tokyo. And here is a close-up of one of those medals. Other sailors took an opportunity to scrawl messages on the bombs, like the one actually penciled on the fin here. It said, quote, I don't want to set the world on fire, just Tokyo. And another, bombs made in America, laid in Japan. Afterward, the airmen loaded ammunition in preparation for the raid. Now, an important player in the Doolittle story is Japanese Admiral Yamamoto, who, as I noted earlier, was the architect of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And Yamamoto is a fascinating figure. He's the son of a samurai warrior who later studied at Harvard. He's one of the few people in the Japanese military chain of command who understood America's great national resolve. And he, had, as a result of that, had resisted the attack on the United States. Now, the Japanese public, of course, in these early months after Pearl Harbor, were celebrating their nation's many successes. But it was a celebration and a euphoria that Yamamoto disdained. And he feared that America's aircraft carriers, which had been missing at Pearl Harbor, were going to come back and haunt Japan. And it was a fear that grew into an obsession, and so much so that he demanded daily weather reports and, uh, over Tokyo. And only on days when it was cloudy or rainy did he seem to relax. He went so far as to advise a geisha friend of his to move all of her personal property and belongings outside of the city. Now, Yamamoto's fears led him to create a fleet of picket boats. Now, the Japanese were not early adopters of radar like the United States, believing poorly that, that eyesight was better than radar. And, uh, and so as a result of that, they created a, uh, a fleet of picket boats that were designed to park anywhere from about 80 to 1,000 miles off the Japanese coast. The idea being that any inbound American task force would run into these boats and that would give them time to radio that the Americans were coming and to get ready. More than that, however, Yamamoto continued to push Japan to go back and finish the job his forces had failed to do at Pearl Harbor. The absence that Sunday morning of America's aircraft carriers, of course, haunted him, and he, uh, and he was looking for a way to lure the American carriers back into battle so he could finish the job the Japanese had failed to do that Sunday morning. He originally wanted to go back and hit Hawaii again, but he knew the Japanese Army would never green light that, so instead he set his sights on a small windswept coral atoll about 1,200 miles from Oahu, known as Midway. Midway at the time was home to a submarine base and a naval airfield, and he also knew that in the, this small chunk of rock out there was really, in the eyes of the Americans, was a priceless piece of Pacific real estate, one that the Americans would have no, no option otherwise but to engage and bring our carriers back into battle and give them the opportunity to destroy them. To Yamamoto's surprise, however, his, his scaled-back plan met with uh, resistance not just from the Army but also from his colleagues in the Navy. Little did he know that as he's struggling there in Japan that Jimmy Doolittle is about to help him make his final sales pitch for this operation. Meanwhile, each hour, each mile, the American ships grew closer and closer to the enemy's backyard. And throughout that task force, the earlier excitement of the mission was replaced by soaring tensions as radio men hunkered uh, over their receivers 24 hours a day monitoring Japan's broadcast. No one stewed more than Jimmy Doolittle. The Hornet's chaplain, in fact, saw him one night pacing from rail to rail, the weight of this entire mission resting on this one man's shoulders. Early in the morning of April 18th, the task, for, task force's radar began to light up with blips. These were Yamamoto's picket boats. At this point, the task force is still more than 1,000 miles away from Tokyo. Rather than engage, the task force attempts to sort of thread its way between these picket boats. Literally every hour, every mile matters. Finally, at daybreak, however, the task force is spotted. American pilots and gunners have no choice but to spring into action, ultimately destroying several Japanese picket boats, rescuing a few prisoners of war, but not, however, before the Japanese were able to radio that the Americans were coming. So that element of surprise, which they had so fought so hard for, was actually spoiled at this point. Meanwhile, back on board the carrier Hornet, Doolittle faces an incredible dilemma. When he designed this operation, he'd set 400 miles as the optimal takeoff distance. 400 miles, he could take off, he could bomb his objectives in, to in Tokyo, and he could still have enough fuel to escape to free China. He set 650 miles as the outside maximum from which he could take off and still accomplish this mission. He's over 800 miles at this point by the time that they're spotted and sink these picket boats. Taking off now is virtually a suicide mission. So what is he going to do? 
The weather that morning was atrocious. Heavy seas crashed against the bow of the Hornet, sending water up over onto the, uh, the deck. Doolittle climbed into the cockpit of the first bomber. Just 467 feet separated him from the cold Pacific waves. He flashed the thumbs up signal, uh, to sign to the signal officer who clutched a checkered flag. Sailors pulled the wheel chocks out as the officer waved his flag in circles, si signaling Doolittle to push the throttle all the way forward. Everything ready, he asked his crew chief. Everything's okay, Colonel, came the response. The signal officer dropped the flag and Doolittle released the brakes. The bomber roared down the flight deck at 8.20 a.m. Doolittle passed 50 feet, then 100, then 200. He's never gonna make it, someone on deck shouted. The bomber charged toward the end of the flight deck and then appeared to vanish. Doolittle's gone, one of the Army navigators thought to himself. We'll have to make it without him. But then that bomber roared up into the gray skies over the carrier's bow. Sailors crowded along the flight deck and the carrier's island erupted in cheers. The shout that went up should have been heard in Tokyo, the mission's doctor recalled. And this photo here from that, uh, from that mission is probably one of the most famous photos of World War II showing the takeoff from the deck of the Hornet on April 18, 1942. The other 15 bombers followed Doolittle one right after the other, flying just above the wave tops en route to Japan. The 16 bombers flew in at rooftop level over Tokyo and other key industrial cities like Kobe and Osaka. Each plane carried just four bombs. Crews flew over baseball games. Children waved. A few even threw rocks at one of the bombers. Airmen could see the muddy moat in Tokyo that encircled Emperor Hirohito's palace. Now this is actually one of only two photographs uh, shot by the raiders that exist today. It's actually a photo of the uh, naval base in Yokosuka. This is the other photo, and you can tell they're not, they're not really spectacular photos, it's kind of what you'd expect when you're shooting out of a uh, plane flying in you know, 230 miles per hour. Now, there have been a few books done in the past on the Doolittle Raid, but not until this project did anybody look in Japan's archives to see what records might exist from their perspective that might, might shed insight into this historical raid. And when we did, I was amazed to find that the after-action report of the Doolittle Raid still existed in Tokyo, in the archives. And I was surprised for a couple of reasons. Number one, Japanese toward the end of the war began to destroy massive amounts of their documentation, hoping that it would not fall into American hands and be used against them in war crimes trials. And number two, because the United States intensively firebombed Tokyo uh, over the 1945, six different times, destroying about 56 square miles of the capital. And if you're looking for a book on that, I would highly recommend Black Snow. Sorry, I just have to, <laughs> have to promote that. But, uh, so anyway, so the, the combination of these two things really added up to the fact that there was probably not going to be much there. But I was miraculously surprised to find that the after-action report, in fact, existed. And on that were about 40 photographs that had been taped down onto that report. These were about three by three images. We don't have the negatives, but we, were, we, we did get the photos, and we were able to scan them in and clean them up. And they give us a perspective of what, what it was like on the ground during the Doolittle Raid. And what's fascinating is if you look at these images, not only do they tell us a little bit about that mission, but they also point to a Tokyo in a very different era. And folks who've been there today know the city filled with steel and glass high rises and whatnot, but that was not Tokyo of 1942. Tokyo of 1942 was largely one and two story wood framed buildings. Literally 98% of the capital was made of wood and paper. And of course they had no zoning, so it wasn't like you had all your industry in one area, your apartments in another, and commercial elsewhere. It was all just mixed in together, just this dense uh, clustering of steel mills, munitions factories, homes, schools, etc. And so these photos kind of give us a little bit of that window. This is actually bomb damage from one of the raiders. It's actually a, a few homes that were struck there. It gives you a sense, you can see all the wood construction there. Here's another, actually this is a photograph here of a wooden factory building that was hit. This is actually a crater left by one of the 500-pound demolition bombs. And uh, the raiders, all told, destroyed about 112 buildings in Tokyo and damaged about 53. 87 people were killed and, and about 500 others wounded in the raid. This is actually a bomb crater near the Asahi Electrical Manufacturing Corporation in Tokyo. It measured more than 15 feet wide and 10 feet deep. And this one actually gives you a little bit better perspective it's because you have some people there, some Japanese officials there that kind of lend that much needed perspective on how big it was. This one's kind of the same in that you have an official standing there in a crater that measured six feet deep and almost 43 feet wide. 
And next to them you can see uh, the blown out panels and windows of another wooden factory building. And here too is another, uh, this is a residence in Tokyo that was hit. And another angle of workers there afterwards on site. Now the Japanese were really curious to learn everything they could about this mission. And so what you're looking at here actually is you can see uh, sort of the top there is a, a top of a head. You're looking from the inside of a building out as workers were literally digging down deep into the pluff mud of Tokyo of, uh, over 10 feet down before they were able to recover an unexploded, uh, one of our unexploded bombs, a dud there. So just some really fascinating stuff uh, from their archives. This is a photograph from the Yamiuri newspaper the day after the raid showing how low the Doolittle Raiders came in, sort of just rooftop level, and you can see some of the black clouds of anti-aircraft fire there. And of course, the headlines in the newspapers, because they were controlled by the Japanese government, of course, are filled with propaganda. And, and one of the headlines here says, quote, as pledged, a glorious defense of the homeland. And uh, it's quite a, uh, a humorous headline because none of the Raiders were actually shot down over uh, Tokyo. In fact, only two of the 16 bombers suffered any kind of damage whatsoever. It was just my minor flak damage. All 16 bombers made it out of Japan. Low on fuel, one pilot diverted to Russia, where the authorities interned him and his crew for 13 months. The rest flew on to mainland China, and as they were crossing over the East China Sea there, the, uh, the fuel lights that they had all so feared when they took off all began to, to pop on, and the raiders were terrified they weren't going to make it until out of nowhere this tailwind comes in and it blows them across the, the, the water there. And the, the Raiders would later refer to that as the, uh, as the hand of heaven. And still, even as they're closing in on the coastline of China and they can see the water color begin to change from blue to brown, indicating that mud and sediment there, that they're getting close. And they think they're about to make it. Uh, it's getting toward nightfall and whatnot. Suddenly, storms materialize and it starts getting dark on them and rain is beating against their windshield and the fuel lights are on. And the Raiders all realize at this point that they're aiming for these gravel runways tucked between 10,000 foot mountains, that there's no way they're going to be able in the, the rain and the nightfall to be able to find them. And so they have to make a decision at this point as to whether or not they're going to try to crash land on beaches or whether they're going to bail out. Three of the raiders were killed during this time. Eight were captured by the Japanese, while the rest of them actually received help from locals and missionaries. This is actually a photograph of Jimmy Doolittle next to his wreckage the day after the raid. Now Doolittle, he's here sulking, as you can see there. Here's another photo of uh, his wreckage there because he has no idea where his crew is or where all the rest of the other bombers are. And here he is, one of America's top airmen, and he had to bail out of his plane, and, and he's convinced that the mission is an absolute failure. And so he manages to link up with his crew chief, a guy by the name of Paul Leonard. And Paul Leonard can sense that the boss is sulking here. So he decides he needs to cheer him up a little bit. So he goes over and he says, you know, boss, he says, um, you know, this mission's not a failure. In fact, I'm convinced that when we get back, they're going to give you the Medal of Honor for this. And Doolittle looks at him, and, and, and he was dear friends with Paul. And he said, Paul, I appreciate what you're trying to do here and all. But um, we know really the mission's a failure. We, we lost all the planes. I don't know where anybody is. Uh, they're going to court-martial me for this. And so Leonard says, all right, <laughs> got to regroup here. So he comes back and he says, okay. Not only are they going to give you the Medal of Honor, they're going to make you a general. Now, remember, he's a lieutenant colonel at this point, so he's going to have to skip a rank. Now, uh, now, we're going to come back to that story in just a few minutes, so just remember that. So Doolittle does eventually link up with the rest of his crews here. You can see him here. Uh, to, to, to our left, to Doolittle's right, is Dick Cole. He was the last surviving Raider, passed away just a few years ago at the age of 102. Um, Doolittle's crews came down over an area of about four hundred square miles of China. So you can imagine, the and it's not the China you see today. This is a, a rural, primitive environment of, of uh, mountains, of forests and whatnot. It's not the overdevelopment that you see so often there today. Now, a few of the Raiders were injured, none worse than Ted Lawson. If anybody watched the movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo or read the book, uh, then you know that Ted Lawson was the one that had to have his left leg amputated by a, uh, uh, the mission's doctor at a rural Chinese hospital. Um, the other Raiders, had to then make their way across rural China using any form of transportation available, including rickshaws, sedan chairs. One crew even rode miniature ponies, but unfortunately we do not have photographs of that one. <laughs> Everywhere the raiders went, they were greeted as celebrities uh, and heroes because, of course, China had been at war with Japan for much longer than the United States, and so this was a welcome strike back. 
Their hero status was made official when they reached Chongqing, which was China's wartime capital. There, Madame Chiang Kai-shek awarded them all Chinese commendation medals. Now, the raiders all fell absolutely in love with Madame Chiang Kai-shek, okay? She had actually studied in the United States. She'd gone to high school in Georgia, of all places, and so she spoke English with a southern accent. <laughs> and uh, the raiders called it her Scarlet O'Hara accent. And, uh, and so at one point she's like, oh, I'd really love it if you guys gave me one of your caps. And so every raider is taking his cap off and trying to give it to him. And so, so they just fawned over Madame Chang. And so at one point they're having a big group photo taken, like you see here, and she's in front of a couple of the raiders. And one of the guys is standing right behind her, and he looks over at his buddy, and he says, man, there's no way I can ever show this picture to my girlfriend. And Madame Chang looks back at him and goes, is she a blonde or a brunette? <laughs> so... Uh, and, of course, she met with Doolittle while he was there to present him with his medal. But, of course, Doolittle's biggest honor awaited him when he got back to Washington. And here you're seeing FDR presenting him with the Medal of Honor. He also learned when he got back to Washington that he had, in fact, been promoted to Brigadier General. So it just goes to show you, your crew chief always knows best, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> now, for the eight raiders captured by the Japanese, the story was far from over. Those raiders suffered horrific torture, beatings, waterboardings at the hands of the Japanese. The raiders were ultimately put on trial and convicted in a sham proceeding that lasted less than 30 minutes. The Japanese sentenced them to death, but ultimately commuted the sentence of five of those raiders to life in prison. Three of those raiders would ultimately face the firing squad, including Billy Farrow, a native of Darlington, South Carolina. Now, on the eve of their execution, the Japanese allowed the raiders to write final letters home to their families. They never mailed those letters, however, but they were found at the end of the war in a Shanghai funeral home. And so we were ultimately able to return those letters in 1946 to the families of those airmen who were executed. And it's from, and it's from that finding that we know that on the eve of his execution, Billy Farrow wrote four letters. He wrote one to his mother, he wrote one to his aunt, he wrote one to his best friend, and he wrote one to his girlfriend, Elizabeth Sims, who he had met as an undergraduate student at the University of South Carolina. And he showed incredible maturity for a 24-year-old on the eve of his execution. He wrote to her, quote, You are the only girl that would have meant the condition of my life. I have realized the kind of life being married to you would have meant to me and to both of us, and I know we would have found complete happiness. It is a pity we were born in this day and age. At least we found part of that happiness. Find yourself the good man you deserve, Lib, because you have so much to give to the right one. Now, the Japanese came for Billy Farrow, Dean Hallmark, and Harold Spatz on the afternoon of October 15, 1942 taking them out to public cemetery number one on the outskirts of Shanghai. The raiders were made to kneel and were then bound to three crosses, similar to the ones you see here in this photograph. The Japanese then placed a white cloth around the airmen's heads with a black dot drawn to mark the center of the forehead. A single shot killed each of the raiders. The other raiders would spend the next 40 months in Japan's notorious prisoner of war camps, where raider Bob Meter starved to death. This is actually a message that the raiders carved into the floor of one of their prison cells. And if you ever get up to the National Museum of the United States Air Force up at Wright Pat, this is, artifact is on display there. They have a wonderful, wonderful exhibit for the Doolittle Raid, probably the best one of any museum in the country. And, and it's fascinating artifacts like this that help make it such. Now, the captured raiders were not the only ones to suffer, to have serious consequences as a result of this raid. The Doolittle Raid eradicated the opposition to Yamamoto's plan to take Midway. If American carriers could strike Tokyo, then the flat tops were still very much a threat and needed to be destroyed. However, that June 1942 proved disastrous for the Japanese. But it was the Chinese who suffered the worst. In an effort to prevent America from ever using coastal airfields, as well as to punish the locals who had helped Doolittle and his men, the Japanese launched a three-month retaliatory campaign against China that led to an estimated 250,000 deaths. Troops cut off the ears and noses of villagers, set others on fire, and drowned entire families in wells. The Japanese not only used incendiary squads to systematically torch towns, but unleashed bacteriological warfare in the form of plague, 
anthrax, cholera, and typhoid. Now, it's a part of the story that we have not known as much about until more recently, in part because the United States didn't have any boots on the ground in that part of China. In fact, it wouldn't be until October of 1942 when the first American intelligence officers reached this region of China to see what happened. Over the course of my research, however, I discovered that there were a loads of American missionaries in China at that point. And their archives at DePaul University up in Chicago provided a window into this horrific time period. And what happened actually is these, uh, as you can see here, is these, uh, these missionary records, as the Japanese were doing a march, much like Sherman's march across the South during the Civil War, the uh, locals would flee out into the wilderness here. You can see set up temporary shelter, wait for the Japanese to pass through, then go back, see what the damage was, write letters to villagers far, you know, farther down the road, and then send them off by runner, warning them of the trouble that was to come. Inside these missionary records, we found not only photographs like this, found motion picture footage of one of the downed bombers that they shot. There were letters to their bishops, there were diaries, and one of the more fascinating things included among them were the, um, pro uh, the insurance claims which they filed for their uh, insurance company for the destructions of their parish. It's through these records that we know that Father Wendell Dunker described the bloodshed he saw in a letter to his bishop when he wrote, quote, the Japanese killed anybody and everybody for no reason at all. Every town they enter is a Nanking on a smaller scale. Quote, I cannot tell you the full story of the brutalities inflicted on these helpless people, on men, women, and children, even upon babies, added Father Vincent Smith in a letter of his own. No civilized mind can conceive of the tortures which have been inflicted on all. Now at the war's end, the four surviving Doolittle Raiders were released from prison, all weighing less than 100 pounds. Chase Nielsen would later return to China as a star witness in the war crimes trial. Here, the executioner of the other three Raiders, Sotajira Tatsuda, bows to Nielsen during those proceedings. Four of the men who played a role in the imprisonment and the execution of the Doolittle Raiders were convicted and sentenced to between five and nine years in prison. Now, Doolittle had promised his men on board the Hornet that after the mission, he would throw them all a party at his expense. At the end of the war, and with the last of his raiders home from prison, he prepared to deliver. In December 1945, he rented out rooms in a hotel in Hawaii, and he threw them a huge party that started a tradition that carried on for more than seven decades. Okay? Now, the... Uh, city of Tucson in 1959 got together and raised money and gave the Doolittle Raiders a set of silver goblets. And folks may be somewhat familiar with this story out there. And each goblet had the Raider's name engraved right side up and then upside down. So that when that Raider passed, that goblet could be turned upside down and his name still be legible. Doolittle then added his own bit to this uh, celebration by donating a bottle of 1896 cognac to the Raiders. Okay? And that was the year Doolittle was born. And the idea became that over time, as the last two raiders eventually emerged, they would get together, they would open that bottle of cognac, and they would toast the other 78 raiders that had gone before them. Now, in 2013, the Air Force was starting to get really worried because there were only four new little raid raiders left, and they were, they were all up in their 90s and varying degrees of health, and they were scattered. One lived in Texas, one lived in Montana, and they thought, all right, we can't, we can't have a tradition that ends this way if these guys can't get together. So they kind of forced the hand of the raiders, and they threw a big final toast celebration up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and I was fortunate enough to go visit and hang out in a small, intimate setting of about 600 VIPs that the Air Force invited to this event. <laughs> And they had it up on stage, and they had three of the four Raiders. One of them couldn't travel very well at the time he was in a home. So they had three of the four Raiders, and they brought out that bottle of 1896 cognac, and they opened it up, and they did that toast. And afterwards, I had to ask. I asked Dick Cole, who was Doolittle's co-pilot. I said, Dick, I'm dying to know. Bottle of 1896 cognac, right? That was bottled 16 years before the Titanic went down. What did it taste like? And he said, you know... It was really smooth. And I said, yes, yes, yes. And he goes, but they were chintzy with how much they gave me. <laughs> now, the Raiders, despite the Air Force's effort to make that be the last toast, kept meeting each year, 2014, 2015, 2016. And they hung on. And then finally, the second to last Raider, Dave Thatcher, passed away. And it left just Dick Cole as the final surviving Raider. And Dick Cole was a tremendous individual. He was one of the old guys on the mission. He was Doolittle's co-pilot. He was 27. He was like grandpa next to Doolittle, who was 45. 
And so Dick Cole lived all the way up until uh, 102. He still rode his tractor down in Texas up until he was 100. And so Dick was the last surviving raider. And when, uh, when Dave Thatcher died, they got together just the Thatcher family and just the Cole family for an intimate final toast of just those two families, literally about 15 people in a small conference room up at Wright Pat. And because I'm friends with Jeff Thatcher, Dave Thatcher's son, I got to go and witness this. And it was a powerful conclusion to this amazing story. And that Dick Cole was standing there and they got the goblets back out. They got the bottle of cognac back out. And they poured in that glass and he stood there in that front of that room and they did a roll call of all 79 airmen's names. And after every single name was read, Dick Cole went here, here, here. And then he drank from that, uh, from that cognac. Now, to back up a little bit, uh, to 1947, when these guys were still young, spry, and likely to get in trouble, they all got together back in that same hotel from 1945, and they had quite a party that night. And you can see here, I don't know if you guys can read it there in the back, but this is the, the memo left by the night watchman about their debauchery the night before. <laughs> and he says here, he says, quote, the two little boys added some gray hairs to my head. This has been the worst night I worked here. <laughs> They were completely out of my control. And of course, I, I won't read the whole thing to you, but it, uh, the next morning when presented with this concrete evidence of their uh, misbehavior, you can see here that dozens of them owned up to it and signed off on it. And so, uh, and what's fascinating is, unfortunately, the Air Force had the wherewithal to preserve this precious document in the Air Force archives down at Maxwell Air Force Base. And so if you go down there today, you can actually, uh, with gloves on, you can handle this, this great document. And I'll, I'll, I'll conclude by just saying one thing about Doolittle and, uh, and, and the special bond of leadership that he had with these men that is unique and I think is so symbolic of this story. He was asked one time, of course, Jimmy Doolittle goes on, not just from this raid, but goes on to command the 8th Air Force, has just tremendous success throughout World War II. But he's asked at one point, he says, what is it about the Doolittle Raiders, you know? Uh, what, what, what is it about that bond you had with them? And Doolittle said, it's not that I loved any of my men any the less. It's that I loved a few of them more. And that is how Doolittle looked at the bond he had with those men who flew that first strike against Tokyo in those dark early days of World War II. Thank you all very much. Happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Bob Watson from the National War College, and uh, Mrs. Scott, just FYI, my military records say I'm 6'2", so I can, <laughs> I can relate. Uh, I'll be monitoring questions, and as usual, we have two microphones set up on side, and we have questions online, so if you'd like to ask questions, uh, please approach the microphone, identify yours, or I'll be recognized, and um, that's how we'll do it. The floor is open. Hello, sir. My name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel James Crabtree. I'm Marine Corps Reserve from Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I worked in the Texas Senate, the best single day we ever had was when Lieutenant Colonel Cole was there on the 75th anniversary uh, to recognize him. So my question is, what was it that inspired you to write this book? I mean, the story was around, but your book was excellent. And what, what was it that caused you to write it? Yeah. You know, I, I think this story focuses on a couple of different levels, and, and that's what appealed to me. Is no, Number one, my father was a raging fan of the Doolittle Raid as kids. I think the first movie I saw growing up was 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. So like so many others, you know, I grew up knowing the story. Uh, but what really appealed to me about it is on the one hand, it is the story of an incredible mission, an against all odds suicide operation of these volunteers. Uh, and, and what happens to them as they take off, as they make their way through China. I mean, it's just really, I mean, you, you can't invent a story this dramatic. But on the other hand, it really functions, I think, as a, as a window into America at this point. And, you know, we're so used to when we talk about World War II and we think about, you know, the success of the Allies and the, the Americans, you see the images of the huge American task force and the end of the war coming into the Philippines and whatnot, and it's just a, it's a sea of... Of, of steel and whatnot, but it wasn't that way in 1942. In 1942, there was real fear in the United States, and there was a, a huge effort was going to have to be made by this country to enlist and train 16 million people to build the warships, to, 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 to bring it all together. And in that 
dark time period, America needed a message. They needed to send, FDR recognized that he had to send a, a message to the public to hold on and we will get to where we ultimately ended up in 1945. And so these raiders ultimately functioned in that role. So not only did they go off on this amazing operation and this heroic operation, but they also really functioned to, to, to lift the morale of a shell-shocked nation. And I think that's why this mission is so important because it operates on those two levels. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Hey, good morning, sir. Lieutenant Colonel David Johnson, U.S. Space Force. Um, I, from National War College. So my question for you, you talked about the, the, um, the, uh, the patrol boats uh, on the Japanese side, mm -hmm. you know, finding and being able to radio back. And I'm curious, you know, it's surprising that they, you know, weren't able to damage any of the planes. I'm curious if you know in any research what the Japanese did with that information. Did they take any defensive yeah, so, approaches? Or? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. It's one of those things you just can't get into in 45 minutes when you're trying to compress a 600-page book. Of course, the Japanese had no idea that the, that the America was going to use long-range Army bombers and that would we, be, we would be able to take off as quickly as we did. So they were thinking, okay, if they're going to use single-engine Navy fighters to be able to come in, they're going to have to steam all the way within just a couple hundred miles, two or three hundred miles from Tokyo. And if they're 800 miles out, that's going to take them another 24 hours to cover that distance. So we've got time. And so they were thinking that the raid wasn't going to happen that Saturday morning. It was going to happen on Sunday or on Monday. So they started scrambling at that point, calling up units, trying to get everybody ready and mobilized. From the time they're spotted at 8 o'clock in the morning, it is four hours later at noon when the first bombers appear over, over, uh, over Tokyo. Just, so the element of surprise was actually preserved, but because the Japanese didn't expect the creativity of this type of operation. Yep. Uh, I'm Colonel Terasaki from Japan. Uh, uh, thank you for the lecture. It's a very uh, good to help my uh, understanding of yep. the, uh, that war. And uh, also, the, it's very important to getting the knowledge uh, to uh, never happening again, same mm -hmm. things. Uh, so that is a, a very helpful for me. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, the, the, uh, first, the war is uh, uh, very difficult. It, uh, difficulty is uh, at the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, my, question, my question is uh, uh, regarding to the uh, nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, what were your views on the impact of the nuclear weapons? Uh, how do we... Uh, 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 calculate about the uh, uh, impact for yeah. the, uh, Japan to... Yeah, so the, about, about the, the atomic bombs. And so actually, I, I cover that in my, again, Black Snow, my more recent book actually looks at the firebombing campaign and sort of leads up to the atomic bomb. And, and I think what, it, you know, the atomic bomb is, at that point, you know, Curtis LeMay, by the time of Hiroshima rolls around, um, uh, the United States has destroyed about 170 square miles of Japan cities. I mean, LeMay has, by June of 1945, he has burned about 100 square miles of Japan's leading industrial cities. He moves on to secondary sized cities. And then by the later part of the summer, he has moved on to tertiary sized cities, literally cities of about 35,000 population. He's asked by General Hap Arnold, when do you think the war is going to end? He says, let me give, give me half an hour. I can calculate that for you. He comes back and he says, we will be out of targets by October 1st. Okay, so there was tremendous pressure at this point upon the, uh, the infantry, you know, there was a real, uh, whether or not we could end the war by air power or whether or not we were going to have to come ashore and do it. George Marshall, an old infantryman, was, of course, was disbelieving that air power alone could do it, so there was all this pressure there. Uh, and so what happens at that point is the, the atomic bomb comes in, and it is a, uh, it's a political weapon more than it is anything else, because the only reason Hiroshima existed as a target at that point is because Kurt LeMay had been ordered to hold back a handful of larger cities so that they would have a city in which to test this new weapon on. Uh, and so about four or five cities were held back, uh, because at that point, you know, most of Japan's cities had been burned. And so I, Japan was, of course, looking for a way out of the war, the emperor was, and, uh, but the, Japan was looking for a way out of the war, but they wanted to have some sort of uh, final victory that would give them a better bargaining position at the surrender table. They did not want to have to face unconditional surrender like the Japanese, and they needed to have some, something to help them negotiate. And of course, what they were trying to negotiate for was to preserve the imperial structure of their government, to keep the emperor in his job. And so, uh, and so I, finally, after Hiroshima is bombed on uh, August 6, you know, Hirohito has his top six military advisors. He polls them as to whether or not uh, they're willing to surrender at that point, and they're divided, three to three, as to whether they're going to surrender. 
Okay, Jan August 6th rolls into the 7th, and then the 8th, there's real fear in the United States at that point that the atomic bomb did not work like we had hoped it would, and uh, there had been, George Marshall had been skeptical all along, believing that if we could burn Tokyo with conventional weapons, why is one bomb going to be any different? Uh, and so there was real fear on that. One of the arguments that had been advanced in, uh, by Japanese leaders on why they shouldn't surrender was that the Americans, it was doubtful they had more than one of these weapons. And so they could ride it out, so to speak. And so the fact that Nagasaki is bombed 73 hours after Hiroshima killed that argument. So when the, uh, Hirohito gathers with his senior war leaders, again, after the attack on Nagasaki, and they're arguing back and forth, the prime minister finally turns to Hirohito and he says to him, what do you think we should do? And at that point, he casts the tie-breaking vote. And he says, it is time for us to consider the unimaginable. And that happens early in the morning on August 10th, and from then until the 15th when he does his surrender speech, there's some back and forth negotiations with the United States over what that's going to look like and whatnot. But at that point, Japan is still moving in the direction of surrender. There was tremendous fear, however, that there would be a coup. In fact, Hirohito records his speech. It's about four and a half minutes long. Records it on a record. It is locked into a safe. He is then spirited away, put in a bunker to be protected at that point on the night of the 14th before he's given it, there is a failed attempted coup to try and do him, to try to um, try to stop the surrender. And so uh, at the end of the day, I think the, the atomic bomb, and if you look at Hirohito's surrender speech, it is all about uh, how the Americans have this new weapon, which has the capability to end life in Japan as they know it. It's a political weapon. I mean, the destruction had already been done uh, through all their cities and whatnot. And so I think that that's kind of how I would sort of a long answer to your question, how I would sort of answer on the, uh, the effect of the atomic bombs at the end of the war. Yep. Thank you. Good morning. Hello, sir. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Pagano, U.S. Air Force, College of Information and Cyberspace. You talked a little bit about Jimmy Doodle and his leadership qualities, and you've spoken a little bit about your new book, Black Snow. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the differences between those two central figures, both Jimmy Doodle and Curtis LeMay, and what leadership characteristics they shared or had, had differences. It's a great question, and, 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 uh, and, and in fact, that would actually make a, a, a great book. I, a great, <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. Uh, because, you know, there are two figures that I, I'm just absolutely fascinated by. And, uh, I mean, Doolittle, is, as you can probably tell, I, I kind of nerd out on his background. And, and fortunately for historians, Doolittle was a pack rat. So every time he wrote an idea down on a cocktail napkin, he saved it. So if anybody's interested, go to the University of Texas in Dallas, and you could literally spend a lifetime going through all of his, uh, his writings. Kurt LeMay was also a pretty good pack rat, which I very much appreciated as well. Um, and I'll tell you, when I was going through LeMay's military personnel file, I found an efficiency report when he was a young combat commander in Europe, and it was written by none other than Jimmy Doolittle. And Doolittle wrote that Curtis LeMay is quite possibly the most talented combat commander this war has produced. And what both of those men understood was their aviation. They were big, but they, they, both of them were incredibly accomplished flyers. They understood, I mean, Doolittle uh, had literally come of age with flight. Uh, LeMay's a, a good bit younger than he was, but. Um, you know, but had, had come along afterwards. They, they both knew their equipment very, very well. Um, they both wanted to fly their own missions. In fact, LeMay flew his first mission against Japan uh, out of China. And, uh, and, and finally, they had to tell him, you know too much. You can't fly these missions anymore. He flew with his crews over Europe. Um, the difference between them, though, I would think personally is that, you know, Doolittle, they both kind of came from rugged backstories. You know, Doolittle grew up in Alaska. Le LeMay's uh, father had been kind of a a manual labor and whatnot. So they were both self-sufficient, driven individuals. Um, LeMay la lacked the social grace that Jimmy Doolittle had. LeMay was an awkward official uh, individual. Uh, you know, he'd grown up so poor and he'd put himself through college working all night in a steel mill, literally setting out molds. Four o'clock in the morning, he'd get off, go get a couple hours of sleep, and he'd show up the next morning and take classes. Uh, he never had time for sports, girlfriends, or anything like that. It's amazing he ever ended up married. But the fact that he did, his wife actually ended up being the one that brought that polish and diplomacy to him that he lacked in the early part of his careers. And, uh, and so, but they were, um, you know, um, LeMay was a rougher individual to work for. He had a tight cadre of individuals that, that, that loved him and that he loved, but he did not have the gregarious personality. In fact, he, uh, he, he hated talk and chit-chat. 
uh, so much so that his men called him the diplomat because he just despised speaking. Uh, they also called him Iron Ass uh, because he was a real hard driving individual. Uh, so, but, but that said, his men really came around to respect him much like Doolittle did. So, um, and I'm just kind of spitballing off the top of my head because I've never really thought to put them both together, but I'm, I'm, I'm feeling there's a bigger project here in all of this <laughs> because they really are such fascinating individuals and were so accomplished in what they did. Thanks, that's a great question, thank you. Yeah. Sir? Good morning, sir. Good morning. My name is Bala and I'm a civilian from the Space Force. Uh, and, and thank you for your spellbound narration here. It was just fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, my question surrounds following the raid and, and the consequences that, that China paid uh, in having more than 250,000 deaths and, and the ravages that they faced. So did the U.S. president, before we, we had the nuclear bomb over Japan, did? Did those considerations weigh in his mind? And about about the, what, what might happen to China as a result so what of What has happened to China following the raid? And, and that, did that influence a lot? In it, 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 they were aware, for sure, that, what, that trouble would befall China. I don't think they had any understanding that it would be as awful as it turned out to be. Now, you have to remember, at this point, the rape of Nanking has already occurred, and it's gotten a lot of publicity. And so there is... The atrocities that the Japanese have already committed in China were, were pretty well known at that point and documented. And, I, and the United States did feel that um, there would probably be some sort of repercussions. The flip side of that is the U.S. was actually hoping that all these bombers would survive and that they would then form a new bomber unit in China to be able to help fight the war. And so, of course, that all was lost when all the bombers were destroyed. And so, uh, but you know, they knew the Japanese were a tough adversary and that there would likely be that. I don't think anybody, and Doolittle actually writes in his memoir a little bit that, you know, we were worried about, you know, what, what might happen, but nobody had any idea it would be the level that it turned out to be. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Dan Clark from National War College asks, can you talk about the psychological impact of the raid on the Japanese? Yeah. Was it as impactful on the Japanese psyche as it was on the American psyche? Yeah, it very much was. And I'll tell you, it, um, and, and that was a big part of why this mission, I mean, you have to remember, Tokyo is spread over 200 square miles. You're sending 16 bombers, each with four bombs. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's a pinprick against the Japanese war machine. You, particularly when you compare that to 1945, when we're sending, you know, 1,000 B-29s on some missions a night over Tokyo. And these, of course, the B-29 is far, far larger uh, payload and whatnot. Uh, but that was not what this mission was all about. This mission was about sending a message to the Japanese people that even four, four months into this war, you're vulnerable here. And, and what it did is it prompted, it, it, um, it prompted the Japanese to have to recall some of their frontline fighters who were elsewhere in the empire because they realized they were going to need them for homeland defense. Uh, it certainly rattled uh, Yamamoto. He locked himself in his stateroom on board his ship and didn't come out for about 24 hours. I mean, he was worried he was probably going to get his... Uh, get executed, uh, and, and, and it certainly did. The, the United States was looking at whether or not they could replicate this mission again, and, and that idea to sort of continue to strike like this, but events of the war moved very, very quickly at this point. Battle of the Coral Sea, Battle of Midway, and whatnot. And so as we, anybody who studied World War II knows, 1942 is such an incredibly pivotal, fast-moving year that the consequences of the Doolittle Raid and the idea of replicating are soon overshadowed by the events of the war themselves. But it certainly, it rattled the Japanese public. Um, the Japanese went all the way over to China to recover uh, crash sites in order to bring them back, put them on display in Tokyo to try to send a message and then lie to the public and say, we shot these down. They wanted to parade, as you saw the photo of Bobby Height there, for images to be able to show that they had been, uh, they were trying to prop up the fact that they had done a good job defending when they actually hadn't. So. Good morning, sir. Thank you for your presentation today. I am Shannon Holmes Terry from the Eisenhower School. Um, earlier in my career, I had actually worked on the beginnings of what is now the B-21 program, which was aptly named after the Doolittle Raiders. So we had a very quick response time, in theory, 
based on what Doolittle was able to pull off. Now it takes us years or decades to actually be able to put together something at this level from a weapons standpoint. How important do you think the innovation and outside the box thinking that Doolittle was able to pull off was part of the key success of yeah. the Doolittle rates no, in general? Yeah, that's a great question and I think it's everything. Look, I mean, I can't get my car washed in four months. I mean, and so the idea of putting together a joint operation of this magnitude, I mean, in that amount of time is, is tremendous. And, but I also think it shows where the country was at that point. And when Hap Arnold told Jimmy Doolittle, you have my full authority for everything you need, Doolittle cashed that check everywhere he went. You know, no is not an option. You know, I need to have these planes modified. I need you to figure them out how to do it. And so, uh, but that, that really spoke to the necessity of that time period. I mean, when, you're, when you've been hit like we were then, it, it's a real motivator. And I think the Navy was just as much on board as the Air Force was. Uh, you know, to, to create a joint service operation like this is, it was very significant. And it took both sides the willingness and the creativity to come together and make it happen. Thank you. And as, as an aside, would you sign my book before you leave? Of course. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> hey, sir. Dan Richardson, United States Air Force from the Eisenhower School. So I kind of want to build on your, your last answer. I'll be honest, like we're supposed to be a joint force, right? Mm -hmm. And this was very much a joint endeavor. But I think, you know, as an airman, right, I typically approach things from an air-minded lens. And I don't know that it would naturally occur to me to partner an air force platform or then an army platform, right, with, with the Navy. Um, can you talk to, during your research, was this something that was embraced wholeheartedly by both the Navy and the Air Force? Was there... Um, or Army Air Force, sorry, I've got to give them credit where credit is due. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, or, or was there sort of reluctance? Like, you know, the Navy was like, you know what, we could probably do this all ourselves, right? Yeah. Using those single engine fighters. And, and the Army Air Force is trying to think about whether they can get planes over to China to conduct a raid that way. Or, or was it like based on where the country was? Anyway, if you could speak to that. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm always surprised why the Navy wasn't like, we'll just use belly tanks. You know, we can go farther, you know, do something like that. But no, they, uh, they wholeheartedly embraced it. I mean, and I think you had, and it was, a, it was a small group of individuals. Secrecy was paramount at this point. And so you had Ernest King working directly with Hap Arnold and, uh, and their staffs working directly. And, and that takes a lot because Ernest King was not a fun guy to work with or work for. I mean, he was basically a junkyard dog personality-wise. And uh, his own staff was terrified of him. In fact, when uh, Francis Lowe came to pitch him the Doolittle Raid idea, he was terrified. He goes into his stateroom there, you know, and, and he says, well, you know, I've got this idea. And he's, he's absolutely convinced that the Admiral's going to bite his head off on it. Instead, King leans back in his chair and puts his hands out and he goes, you know, Lo, you might be on to something. Go see Hap Arnold. And so they kind of came together. But no, there wasn't really any reluctance at that point. You got to remember, they were all hearing from Roosevelt, make this happen, make this happen. They were trying to figure out how to do it. And, uh, and so, hey, here's an idea, run with it. Thank you. Okay, so that's uh, our last question. Uh, on behalf of the National Defense University, I'd like to thank you for this fascinating case study and very human story. Yeah. And um, I think it demonstrates to us that leadership, initiative, and most certainly daring can have absolute strategic impact. So please uh, join me in thanking our speaker. to talk on this. Yeah, of course.